welcome everybody to the uh, fourth episode of the Martini. Thank you for joining us. And my name is Gus. I'm Ari Rentals Director of Business Development for North America. And I've been with Ari, with the Ari family now for over 17 years and honored to be your host again today. Um, at Ari Rental, our goal is to equip you, the filmmakers with the most inspiring image technology in the world. Our services cross borders and continents with a network of facilities in North America, Europe, and the UK bringing you first-class camera, lighting, and grip equipment, wherever you may be. And our team is there to welcome you with friendly expertise, personalized solutions, and a relationship built on trust. As a friendly reminder today, please send us in your questions via the Q&A tab on Zoom, and we'll get to many of the, as many of those as possible during the course of the show today. We are very fortunate to have with us today the incredibly passionate and talented cinematographer, Greta Zazula. Uh, she is based in New York City, and she started out, you know, working her way up through the camera department and transitioned into shooting short films. And she quickly moved into independent features and was recognized by American Cinematographer as one of 2020's rising stars. So um, Greta's features include Never Going Back, uh, which premiered at the 2018 Sundance Film Festival, Light for Light, which premiered at the 2019 Sundance Film Festival as well. And uh, we're really excited to have her with us today because uh, her Netflix feature, the half of it, uh, premieres today. It started today on Netflix and it just won an award at Tribeca, which is awesome. Congratulations, Greta. That's very cool. And she also has another project, wow, called uh, Materner, which is also won Best Cinematography at the Tribeca Film Festival we just found out this year. This is fantastic. So congratulations and thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. This is great. This it's is really, really fun. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I forgot to mention, you also have an upcoming uh, movie called Becky that you just finished. It looks like it's yeah, it is. Yeah, and it just got a uh, premiere for June fifth. Uh, it'll be digital release. Oh, cool. Good deal. Yeah, I can't wait yeah. to see that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fun one. <laughs> All right. Well, this is the fun part of the show. Are you ready? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be so bad. <laughs> uh, my reputation precedes me, I see. Yes. <laughs> we have a little fun icebreaker kind of pop quiz thing that we like to do. Um, I'm, I'm, it's it's going to be fun. Don't worry about it. It's going to be good. So okay. I'm, I'm going to throw up three images from various projects, and I would like mm -hmm. you to tell me who the cinematographer was. <laughs> oh god because you know i'm gonna know who it is and i'm not gonna i'm not gonna remember the name so it's gonna be great <laughs> all right well let's let's give it a shot i may have forgotten already too so <laughs> here we go let me just make sure i can uh get everything sorted here okay all right so here's the first one can you see that okay yeah here's the second one and here's the third one <laughs> Okay. Name that cinematographer. <laughs> I, so, oh, it's, yeah, it's one person, obviously. Uh, Chivo. <laughs> there you go. Very good. All right. Excellent. All right, next. Here we go. One, two, and three. <laughs> Can you go to the first one again? No, that would be cheating. No, oh, man. Cheating. <laughs> I didn't realize she... Ellen Kerr. Yeah. yeah, very good. Wow, you're I didn't fantastic. realize. <laughs> no, it's just because I just watched Blow. I, did, I had no idea she shot that. Ah, cool. <laughs> Which All I, right. you know, obviously that's a terrible thing for me to say because I should have. <laughs> That's good. That while I was watching it, but. I haven't great. seen it in so long. I have to watch it again. Yeah, it's great. All right, here's our third quiz. Mm -hmm. mm. You've got this. I got this. <laughs> <Are you speedy? laughs> Yay, excellent. All right. I love all those films. <laughs> yes, amazing. All right, last one. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Bradford Young. Yay! Ding, ding, ding! You get the prize. Very Yay. good. Yay! Wow, four, four, four. I'm proud for it. That's great. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm so. <laughs> yeah, I'm really surprised I got all those names. That's that's great. See, it wasn't too bad. 
Could have been. Yeah, that was great. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so um, tell us a little bit about how you got started in this industry. I always like to hear everybody's story. Um, I guess I'll start with school. Um, or like right before school, I did a like a pre college course um, that was like basics of filmmaking. I uh, was at Princeton and uh, I had never done anything film related before, um, other than like home movies with my sister, which were really fun. But <laughs> uh, and that that was the course that I fell in love with filmmaking because I just realized that this incredible collaborative process like I love movies forever and um, was always fascinated with movies and filmmaking um, but didn't realize the collaboration that goes into it so Mm. when I did the course at Princeton I was like I have to do this for the rest of my life I don't like I didn't know what I wanted to do but I just knew that I had to be on set and I had to do that Um, so I looked up a bunch of schools uh, film schools and found one I wanted to move to New York that was like the one thing that it didn't matter where like what's at the time it didn't matter what school it was just New York was the was the goal um so I found School of Visual Arts and uh studied cinematography there and um you you shoot other students projects so I I shot a couple like thesis films um as a DP and then uh, started working on sets like my junior year. So it was like, before I even graduated, I was like already like, I'm, I'm, I'm out <laughs> um, and working on set and uh, started as a grip and then um, switched over to acing and really just worked my way up um, and, and did it through kind of the indie film world. So it was movies that um, they were a little bit smaller, but they were just, great films with fantastic cinematographers that I learned a lot from and um and I and I got to learn on film so I, you know started as a loader and uh the first project I ever pulled focus on was uh 35 anamorphic and it was terrifying oh, wow. and I did it uh blind like basically blind it was like a handheld shot the I wasn't I wasn't the AC I was the second and the AC w- was going to operate the shot. So he was like, do you think he can do this? And I was like, I have no idea. <laughs> um, and he gave me the, the, um, the, the remote and um, he walked me through it and we, and we did the shot. And I was like, yeah, like it was amazing that he did that because it gave me the confidence to, to, to move, like to move into AC like first thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I uh, first did a whole uh, into a whole feature on film, and that was just amazing. Um, wow. Wow. And uh, yeah, and and then started shooting short films. Um, started with other film schools. Uh, I did a, a short called Immaculate Reception that was a Columbia Masters thesis, I believe. Um, and kind of just any project that came my way if if I responded to the script and the director if we got along and we were on the same page I'd do that project I I wasn't I wasn't like being picky necessarily because um like I was being picky even with short films because I wanted to make sure that the first projects that went out there were like really representing the work I wanted to do um and even though I I believe in like practice, 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 like shoot as much as you can. I also wanted to make sure that they were projects that I was passionate about and and cared about. And um, so I, so I, I did stay picky with, with shorts and, and then, um, and then got my first feature, uh, never going back in 2017. Yeah. 2017. And and that was great. And, and here we are. (laughs) That's awesome. I, um, I'm going to jump a little bit um, yeah. in, our, in our timeline because actually I think this might be a good point to talk about some of the things you and I have been discussing the last couple of days and that's the, the films and the filmmakers that you know you, you keep coming back 
back to and the things that really stick in your head. And so I'm going to share some images with the audience and we'll just kind of talk through some of those that you shared with us, if that's okay, because I think it sure. ties into your school experience. And as you grew as a filmmaker, the things that really kind of um, uh, influenced you in a way. So I'm going to pull that up now. And so hopefully you can see the first image here, which is, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> As you and I said, I have to, I want to go back and watch this movie now. It doesn't feel like yeah, I I did. I just went back and watched it um, yeah. last night. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Incredible! I watched it not too 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 long ago before that, but I I rewatched it last night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, such a beautiful um, job. Yeah, I, well, we were talking, I mean, I, this is going to be skipping ahead, but I feel like it needs some, some context of, of us talking about Solaris and, and um, yes. yep. just loving, absolutely loving Tarkovsky's, um, just the way that he views people. Yeah. Oh, and now we're, now we're on to something. Else. <laughs> I can go back. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, but just how he captures emotion and, um, and his the his fascination with nature um, versus technology and and and, and nature um, versus like exploration and and in Solaris there's you know there's this huge contrast between um, Earth and nature and and then the wanting to escape from it and um, and leaving it behind and I feel there's like a very similar um, uh, in Alex Garland's work, um, Narab Hardy's work, the, the, mm. the, the very, very similar ideas um, yeah. to that. And um, I just love his composition as well. Very strong. Yeah. And then we moved yeah. on to this work, which is yeah. so beautiful from Andrea. Yeah. And again, it's just the, the, her, like the way that she captures people and emotion. Um, I mean, lighting is also incredible as well. Yeah. This, this film has been a reference in so many projects. Um, a couple short films, for sure. This, this, this was, <laughs> yeah, just beautiful. If you have any insight into, you know, um, cause you're gonna know better than I am you know, these particular mm -hmm. projects, how they went about it. I think it's interesting one for, you know, the, to talk about the format of four by three and how that's so that's had such a strong following lately, especially and, um, and how you compose for that. But um, we've yeah. got various projects kind of mixed in here and I'm sorry, it's not yeah. queued up in, uh, but you know, it's, um, I haven't, I haven't shot a project myself in that aspect ratio. I definitely, if, if depending on on the story and certain co like compositional wants and needs, I, I was talking um, to someone about this before. It's like yeah. that kind of aspect ratio is interesting to me because there's usually a lot of the time it, it forces the frame to be at the bottom. Yeah. So I always find that interesting because your eyes kind of tend to want to look that way, like they relax mm. to the bottom of the frame. Um, so I always loved that comp that aspect ratio for that reason because it it allows this this um, composition that I think is really unique, mm -hmm. um, and and it always made me wonder like if that's why you know the the headroom is usually so so prominent <laughs> in these frames where it's like if you were to um, if you were to get rid of that headroom it would it would it would without even really under understanding why if if you if you weren't looking for it it's like the it would feel like a very off frame. It, it wouldn't feel right. Um, right. And then the, um, the next uh, mm -hmm. images you shared with us. Um, yeah, going in a different direction. I think the lighting is pretty incredible. With yeah. What's accomplished here from, um, so this yeah, is from the film is. Blue in the color trilogy, right? Yeah. yeah. This, this maybe is in here just because it's been a, influence forever for me um this is like the opening scene of that film yeah. it's just it's like it's burned into my brain 
um, just that form of storytelling. It's so, um, the build up. I mean, the, the way that he was, he was able to build up that much emotion into just the first like four minutes of the movie. Hmm. And then just following her and being inside her head for the rest of the film. Yeah, and the close-ups, the extreme close-ups that are achieved in this film are amazing. And just watching the sugar cube yeah. absorb the coffee, you know, it was mm -hmm. like, <laughs> it's such a Yeah, there's shot. a great, there's a great uh, interview with Kieslowski about that scene that's worth checking out. Um, and he wow. just talks about the, the, the importance of timing um, and, and why, why that, like he had a, an assistant like pick out the perfect size uh, sugar cube so that it timed out perfectly for the scene and I always found that to be amazing because the detail you know everything's in the details mm -hmm. um, and and I, I tend to love filmmakers who they they will have these these tiny little details that you may or may not notice on the first pass but if you were to watch the film a few times um, right. You would you would notice, and and even if you didn't, they they impact the story. Even if you don't know, um, I think there's another thing that he said was, in it, it, it was in another one of his films, Red, that um, this is another one, uh, that he would he would repeat images. He would go back to locations and repeat compositions so that the the audience, even if they weren't aware. Um, of it the first time eventually they would be because you would keep mm. coming back to like a similar image. Hmm. I love the color in this film. Yeah. You now it's it's called like the it's like the unofficial uh fourth film of the series. And they call it like the golden film, but I, I oh, yeah. there's so much green and yellow in it. I mean the, <laughs> there's a lot of gold tones as well, but I just love that like green um color throughout yeah. this film as well. And there's also an amazing scene in this film that is just, it blows my mind. I actually don't really know how they shot it. It's like with a crane, or it's, it's towards the end of the film um, where they're, uh, where she's singing just like her, you know, big performance and, and she falls. And the, and the way the camera falls with her and then it like goes over the crowd and comes back and it's, it, there's so much emotion in the camera movement. Um, <laughs> that you, you're like, you're in the moment with, with her and with the audience as it's happening. It's really powerful. Right. And then you included, uh, this was Sofia Coppola's first film, right? Her first directorial film? Yes, I believe so. Um, this is the Virgin Suicides, right? I haven't yeah. seen this in a long time. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, yeah. I picked this movie because, well, actually, I picked kind of the series of images as well because I think the use of color and emotion in this is so great. Mm. Um, but also, like this movie, I, for better or worse, I saw this movie when I was thirteen. <laughs> yeah, and um, it had such like. An emotional impact on me um, and just being able to relate on some levels and, and not relate but just emotionally connect um, with with these characters that's an incredible shot yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry I'm just wanting to make sure we can dig in I know some of the resolution yeah. stuff on these but Ah, and then here we are at Solaris. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So it is interesting to look at these images after looking at Ex Machina and that's... Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, they start out very similarly, actually. Yes, they do. Yeah. You, you <laughs> both films, you're kind of overwhelmed by nature and the beauty of it. And it's very green and lush and you in sound design too like both both things are, are very over over very powerful and overpowering um yeah. and then you're you're transitioned into this kind of you know this is outer this is space and and, and ex machina is underground right. but you're right. trans transferred to this artificial world um 
Yeah. And then some of his earlier work. Yes. Incredible. Again, this is just to me composition and lighting and um, you know, some things we can't see, which is like like the <laughs> camera move in the shot is just amazing. Um, and how he captures spaces. Mm. Like that the one um, close up of of this character earlier on. Um, just absolutely, yeah. Just everything yeah. about that shot. <laughs> <laughs> um, mm. This is interesting. I was trying to determine what was going on here because I don't remember this film specifically, but. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, and that that shot specifically, I just there's again, it's it, the way he captures faces, but also the lighting in that shot is incredible. And so, and so many of these shots too, it's it's a little bit tough. It's they they're great in stills, but like the camera movement in them as well. Mm. Um, just these like really really slow like slow slow. Um, Push in. Right. And here's the nature yeah. connection that you had with Ex Machina. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I read an interesting thing about the costume design in that movie, too, because it's, mm. it's very bizarre. Um, you would think it's not super space stagey, it's not like futuristic. Right. Know? Right. Um, and, uh, you don't know what year you're in. It's not very clear. Yeah, yeah. And that was very, very much on purpose. Like yeah. He didn't want to date the film that way. <laughs> Indeed. So what, um, what draws you to the particular projects you've shot? What is it that uh, really, you know, makes something stand out for you? Yeah. Um, I mean, when I read the script, for me, it's, complex characters. Um, I'm always looking for, um, yeah, uh, that and, and, a, and a script is a, a story that, that I haven't really heard before or it's, or it's asking questions, um, it's asking new questions, you mm. know, it's trying something different or it's, or it's, it's a, an old story, but, but trying trying to explore um, a new way of telling it um, but but usually it's the, the like the emotion of a character that that draws me in um, gotcha and is it um, I, I think it's interesting looking at some of your short work I wanted to put up some of that now for us to look at um, because it is you, you can just tell by the visuals that you shared with us it's extremely you, I mean, you are with the character the entire time and you're in their head. It's and the visuals speak to that. So I'm going to yeah. throw some of the work up from sure. your short films now for us to see too. And um, so this first one uh, mm -hmm. is from Blue, correct? That was the name of it? Yeah. I know it has a longer title, but um, I call it Blue. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, it's uh, yeah. It's it's totally fine. It's it's what the title is. It's just it, there's like an, an added part to it. Um, gotcha. But um, but yeah, this is just following is following one um, character throughout the entire film, um, who is a cam girl, um, and how kind of reality her reality of of doing what she does is is. Um, crossing over into her real her real life and 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 it touches on how you know how we're observed and and through um through the internet and through social media and how we kind of always have eyes on us and, and remember kind of um 
alone and and she just kind of like she gets really inside of her head and she feels like people are watching her all the time even when she's not like in front of the camera like when she's on the subway and and she starts to get very paranoid so um i think we we kind of reflected that a little bit and going back and forth between colors that like when she's more in the camera world and more in in um in her head and in her home there's these like we played with with colors and and greens and reds and and and, and um, purples and when she goes out into the real world it's 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 very like neutral um and not the most inviting place in the world um, right no it's a, it's an amazing color palette that you guys created on this it's really really strong and um and she's very isolated, whether it's in, you know, complete blackness or when you go outside, you know, using the depth of the field the way you guys have. Yeah. And, and when she's on the outside, like, like this kind of composition, like I'm, we're always with her and it's mm -hmm. things that are happening around her. So we're always in her head. Um, so it was very important to be like, as like, you know, we're kind of, I think that was a 50 millimeter or something like we're, as close mm -hmm. as we can be to her without like touching her so you feel like you're like right right there and what did you, what did you guys shoot this on if i may ask this was this was mini and cooks i believe uh s4s mm -hmm. it might have been a mix um because this was this was shot over a few different days, so this might have been a mix of like a um, some Alexis as well, or some okay. Crowns actually. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> I love the I love the colors and how they're bleeding together. That's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a little bit of a mixed format as well. I think um, that that one before um, the the colors kind of bleed that way because we, we were using um, I think we we're using a GV like an HVX or something mm. as like the camera, uh, like the computer camera. Right. Um, and I just love the way that it that it uh, took on color. Like, cause it, it, cause it did things like that where it, it didn't really know how to take the information of some colors and, and it, and it kind of distorted <laughs> it a little bit. And I absolutely love the way that was. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Happy accident. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's like, when you watch the film, it's like very obviously like a, like a digital, like um, mm. an SD kind of camera, but. And then this is, uh, this is, you shared um, more than I was able to download on this particular project. I'm sorry about that. That was some sort of issue I was having with the TIFF files oh, it's okay. coming up, but. Uh, it's a, the stills I picked are very, gorgeous. very dark anyway, so. It's, a, it's um, these two shots are gorgeous just, though, I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was um, influenced by uh, like 70s for um, that image specifically. Hmm. Uh, I was I I failed to get the reference for that one actually because I was going to send to you because it's a great reference. Um, but this film is set in the eighties, um, and it's it, it's a horror film in in a way, um, but it's a little more. And this is going back to like complex character driven films, and and like I I I like every genre and and. And I don't necessarily like one over the other or find like advantages in one over the other in telling stories. But I but I love like when you take a film like Friday, which isn't a horror film, but it it's a it's like a fine line between a, a psychological like character study and a horror film. Um, it doesn't have any horror aspects in it. It's not like there's like gore or it's like jump scares or anything like that. But it's a horror film because of the the severity of of the um, of the time and 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 what she goes through. Mm. Yeah, this is immaculate. Again, uh, this is supposed to be nineteen seventy two, I believe. 
I really admire that, you know, just looking at these projects and each one is completely different, you know, in the visual yeah. stuff. And I, I think that's, that's amazing, you know, cause I, I could, you could just, you know, feel the locations and feel the, the emotions within the frames and know that, you know, it's just two separate projects, you know, it's really cool. This was fun because I'm from uh, Western Pennsylvania and I have never done anything except for this film um, out there and we shot in Pittsburgh and I just loved being able because there's some shots I don't know if I have one in here of, of the um, of the cityscape um, of Pittsburgh and to be able to see it um, I think there is one little bit later if I recall yeah it's great yeah A different light out there completely <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, and just to be able to capture it for this film, which is all about uh, the Steelers in 1972, which is just, that is Pittsburgh. That's it. <laughs> that is like the story everyone <laughs> hears about. Um, so this was like a like going home kind of movie and really, really enjoyed making it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and we, we, we referenced a lot of uh, NFL films for kind of like the color palette for that. Okay. Um, and a little bit of like deer hunter for that like very very dark interior where you you feel the yeah. outside but it's just it's so dark. <laughs> um, so those were, those were references for that film. And I think this might uh, this is going way and I think the images from this project are amazing. How um, how daring this you guys are with these? This is a personal favorite. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, read the director. He was so specific on what he wanted. It was it was really great to work with him. Um, we uh, we did like a Artemis uh, storyboard of the whole film because we we shot in one. He he spent like I, I don't know how many I want to say like a year. It might have been less or more, but it's close to that. Finding the perfect apartment to shoot like apartment building to shoot this film in. Mm. Um, and and it was amazing because we you know during prep we just go to this this um, building and and uh, this is probably the only film that I like shot listed like this where it was like we knew exactly every frame we wanted um, going into it and this actor I've never ever worked with uh, he's ten I believe he wow. he was so dedicated. Um, like I, ne I just had never seen that in, in a child actor before, um, or even like some other actors, like his, his just level of dedication and professionalism is inspiring. I would, you know, I would love to just dig into the lighting, um, and how you achieved it in this particular project. Cause I think it's absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. I mean, just that really delicate, soft overhead lighting it feels like yeah it was um it was a strange it was a little unconventional i think it was a strange mix of things because um like all the all the hallway stuff with the stairs mm -hmm. at night um we used daylight like cfls um and we bounced like i used a lot of these light bulbs um and the gaffer it was was kind enough to like go along with me on this. Um, it just sort of, I don't know why it made sense to this film, but, but we used them a lot for like, we would put them um, uh, like in the hallways of the uh, house as well. We would put right. them in the hallway and then just like put an entire skirt on the bottom of them. So it was just <sighs> really, really soft ambient. So we were just like throwing up really soft ambient everywhere we could. Um, so it was never like, there was never a hard edge light or anything. It's just this like soft, um, a, a contrast of light and dark, soft light. Um, mm -hmm. like in the bedroom, it was bounced off, um, bounced light that was then like through muslin. And, um, That's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, there's, there's questions coming in from the audience here that I'd love to just talk about as we look at more images. So I'm going to bring up um, the next project, uh, Light from Light, which yeah. um, 
you actually shared some really interesting painting references for this. Mm -hmm. And I think um, it answers sort of one of the questions that came through about, you know, the, can you describe the discussions you're having with a director um, before and during the project, you know, to come to an um, kind of a look of the film. So mm -hmm. I think we can answer that and yeah. look at images <laughs> at the same time. So Yeah. I mean, yeah, with Light from Light, it was definitely, um, there was a lot of discussion for that one. Um, it's different with every director, though, um, because in Paul um, Harold, the director, he he came to me with these these images. Um, he had a very specific idea. This is these references are specific to the main character Sheila, mm. um, and those those three those first three were were what we based everything um on her character like th there there will be other stills that will make sense um right. but it was lighting it was um what she would wear her hair mm. how we lit her hair um the things like that that were all inspired by those paintings right so as we get into the the frame grabs you shared with us you know we can look back yeah. and think back those paintings and it's pretty amazing what you guys were able to accomplish yeah and there's a real amazing texture that you uh, created within this film as well through the lighting, through the production design. And I think um, it's, I think you nailed it. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, the, the Helga series um, is, it's an incredible book. It's definitely worth taking a look at too. Um, Andrew Wyeth. Um, but that was a huge influence and reference for the film. And you see it a lot in the choice of, we used a lot of uh, tungsten fixtures um, for a lot of the interiors and that, and that was the huge reference for that. Mm. So there's a, a question about psychology of color, you know, and I think mm. uh, that's, that's a deep, deep conversation, but it mm. does, you know, between your short work and what you guys have done with this film as well. And you mentioned how certain environments have a particular color um, and others have something a little different, so. Yeah, I, um, with, with this film, it's definitely um, a part of it. it. I'm always very subtle with, with my, like with the exception of Blue, which was probably the most colorful film that I shot in terms of like using a lot of different colors. Um, I'm, I'm typically pretty subtle with it. Um, this film, we used warmth um, as kind of, one, it kind of represented Sheila, but also represented her home and, and her uh, kind of like the safety of her home and her environment. And, uh, and you can see kind of outside of that, like her work and, um, and kind of the outside world is much cooler and, and colder. Um, and then Richard's house, I, again, when we first meet him and, and we explore his house, it also has this very kind of stale, um, colder feel. Um, and that's kind of reflective of his state of mind and really what, what, what he, he's dealing with in, in that environment. Um, and, and on top of that, uh, the film takes place in um, Knoxville, Tennessee and borders the Smoky Mountains. and we we tried and worked very very hard to be able to show what what the classic smoky um mountain uh tennessee looks like um <laughs> and and that was a little bit of a challenge uh but we were able to capture it which was just great i think we passed some of those shots already but um yeah we, we and there's a like few a at the end hike yeah a hike through the smoky mountains and uh we got it was terrible weather, like we got rained out basically at the end of it, but but it was worth it because we ended up getting like just the beautiful, um, uh, like this kind of uh, classic uh, Smoky Mountains, which also, to, to go back to the psychology of the film, this is very, very much in the mindset of these two characters at the time. Right. Um, and what they're, what they're discovering and exploring about themselves at, at the moment. Um, in, in this scene specifically. Mm. Yeah. 
So um, another question from the audience here is, do you have a go-to camera package? I'd like to know what your favorite tools are. <laughs> um, I always, you know, I, I tend to end up using the same camera body on most films, um, you know, depending on, on restrictions in terms of format. Um, I do I do typically tend to use uh, Alexa, whether it's a mini or, or uh, I, on the half of it, I use uh, Alexa LS. Um, and for me, and, and for camera bodies, that is kind of what I, what I started with. Like if it wasn't film, it was like that, that was like the next. Um, and, I, and, and it's workflow. Like, like I, I like to operate. I don't always operate, um, but I do love to operate. And I, the way that the camera is built and how you can build it, I really like. Um, but in terms of everything else, like lenses, filters, anything else, it's project to project. Um, hmm. I have used the same lenses on a couple of projects, but otherwise it's like, it's different every time. Gotcha. And the next project, which we've been talking about, the half of it, you, all, you also shared some um, really interesting images and you shared more references too that you and the director had, um, which I think are really cool. And I just wanna bring some of that up as well to talk about. Um, and I just want to make sure we've got it here. There we go. Okay. So you talked about deer hunter earlier and, uh, mm -hmm. looks like another shot from it as well. <laughs> yeah, that reference, uh, was definitely in, cause the movie takes place, uh, in Eastern Washington and we, um, so these references are really tonal, um, color palette uh, mm. for the film. Um, this, was, this was somewhat of a reference for one of the scenes. Um, we went kind of, I, I don't know if I have a still in there, we went with a different color, but it was just kind of like a color ratio. Um, and this was a huge influence. So uh, this was a big one. <laughs> yeah. This is definitely more than the, the other ones. Um, <laughs> that, that plays a very important role in the film. Um, This again was was color palette. Yeah. Um, the very like the beginning of the film, um, you you get a sense of that. Some of these stills uh, don't reflect it as much. Um, there's like Hopper was a big influence, and there's some night scenes uh, that were very very influenced by Hopper. But I don't have those stills. Oh. <laughs> All good. So you said this is supposed to be set in. The Northwest? Northeast is, well, oh. Northwest, Eastern Washington. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. And where did you end up shooting this? We filmed all over New York. Ah. Uh, we, a good portion of it and uh, like a train station that is a very big part of the film was shot in Sundar, in New York, which is very, very far north. Um, this is probably a good example of, of the color palette. Um, and, and this is like that, like that, um, Hopper painting before, that's a good example, uh, her in this, this, um, um, booth where she works out of at a train station and, and that color palette was like, represents her environment and, and the town. Right. Whoops. Let me just go back to that and make sure we have it there. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of that in the film, um, that that like specific location and the environment. There, I think there's a close up of um, Paul, who's one of the characters, and there's a there's a building. It's the train station, and the color of that um, is also very very much a part of the color palette as well. Um, and you know that was part of location scouting for sure, and um, and production design the color on her shirt and when it's a, you know, costume mm -hmm. design, um, all kind of falling under that color palette. Yep. Yeah, it's beautiful. The muted colors. Mm -hmm.
Do you, is there a particular cinematographer that you would say has influenced you um, quite a bit? That's one of the questions that came in from the audience, mm. or the most, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not, not specifically, I wouldn't say. I mean, there's tons of cinematographers that I love. Um, um, but I don't really, I mean, I reference films when I put a lookbook together um, or I put just images together for film but it's always it's always the movie that that influences what I'm looking for for the references it's it's rarely the other way around like I I like I'll read a script and think of the visuals for the film and and something will come into my head of, of how I want to do it um, and then I try to like find the references that best fit that um and that can be really hard sometimes but it's not like i'm like oh like i think of this dp and 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 I'm like i love that that work i mean the movies that i that we reference are obviously um filmmakers that i really love like uh robbie ryan and um uh, uh names. <laughs> I, Robbie Ryan's one of them. I mean, Rodrigo Prieto is another one. Um, um, but, but yeah, I don't know if there's like one, one that, that I, mm. you know, always like go back to, you know, like I always reference these like Kieslowski, um, um, but I don't, you know, that, that's not necessarily um, like some comp compositional references, but that's not like, you know, a go to in terms of like a favorite DP. Um, although I love right. his work and his use of color. Like uh, Gattaca is another film that I love of his, um, that in, in his use of color and, and, and framing. <laughs> Here's a question from my colleague Ryan. He's, he's interested to hear your take on genre. If there's particular genres that you gravitate towards, or if there's something you absolutely are like, yeah, I don't want to ever do anything like that. <laughs> I used to, I used to, um, I don't anymore. I, I find like, if the script, if I love the script, um, I don't really care the, what the genre is. Um, it doesn't really, it doesn't really influence my creativity at all. Like I don't, I don't feel like there's one genre that I wouldn't be able to, to express um, the film visually the way that I would want to. I think if, if I had a certain vision, let's say it was a comedy and I had a, like, I, I feel like The Habs is actually a good example of that. It's that it is, it is a romantic comedy. Um, coming of age teenage romantic comedy and there is a one way of shooting that film um and i think if i had sat down with the director and 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 she had wanted the movie to look that way i would have been less interested in it um but there's there was a, a movie that i had in my head and we were both on the same page about that and and it's a little a little bit softer you know it's 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 a, a little bit darker it's it's not it's um we we approach it a little bit more like a drama um and so i don't think like a certain genre necessarily um determines how you'd have to shoot it so it's it's script for me over genre right and um <clears throat> interesting question here about you know how do you go about exposing do you have a particular um choice do you like to underexpose do you like to overexpose is there, do you make those decisions per project, per scene? <laughs> uh, I definitely tend to underexpose, um, <laughs> for better or worse. Uh, I find, I, you know, if I want, if I'm sh shooting a uh, night exterior, I, I do like to shoot under. Um, I, I do like to shoot it as close to what it's going to look like as possible on set um and i do i do like to shoot dark um but for day exteriors as well i i tend to shoot a little under 
And does that go for both film and digital? Uh, yeah, I, I, Immaculate, I think we, sh we felt, or we shot that, I wanna say it's been a little while, but it was like a stop and a half under for the whole thing. Wow. <laughs> Is there, uh, um, have you ever found yourself in a situation where you felt like you had to compromise your vision, you know, based upon what the director was doing? You know, did they change? Did they, were they going a direction you were not comfortable with? No, I, I've been, I've been lucky in, in some ways that, that all the directors that I worked with, um, we were always on the same page, but I also think that's partly, I can quickly discover if I meet a director, um, whether or not we're going to get along or whether or not it's going to be a good fit. And, and I think they can sense it too. And usually those projects just naturally don't happen. Um, I don't think I don't, I've never been in a situation where that, that I had those feelings and then we went and did the film anyway. Um, and I think what happens naturally with that is that we're just from the beginning on the same page. So our visions are aligned uh, from the beginning. Um, so, you know, even before we start prep, I like to, to know that, you know, that our vision's going to continue to go in the same direction because, um, because yeah, that would be, that would be really, really difficult. And I, I, I don't know exactly how it would feel if like we were in the middle of production and, and we were like, totally completely on the on the opposite um on the opposite page um that would be really difficult mm. and uh so i guess this is more of a uh, maybe not so technical but really really kind of crazy question but it goes back to what you and i were talking about and that's about the audience experience i mean you get a script or you meet a director or you hear a story and you have a certain response to that and a certain experience. How do you, how do you go about ensuring that the audience is going to have that kind of experience as well? Yeah. Um, it's, it's a conversation. It's a conversation with the director about, about the characters, about the, um, kind of the, the their journey um, emotional journey and and deciding um compositionally how to to capture that and like light from light for example we we didn't want the camera to ever influence the emotion and we found that the the actors themselves like if we if we just simply place the camera and let them um let them express the emotion we didn't need to influence it in any way like we didn't need to add a move to it we didn't need to elevate the emotion their raw emotion was um was was all that you needed to see um and i i feel that way a lot like i i play off of actors emotion a lot um in in trying to figure out composition because i think like the director and i will come up with a shot list and some ideas of how we want to capture a scene um and like with paul he, we we were very specific about how we wanted to capture it but sometimes it's a little less specific and there's some guidelines but not not completely and um like with the half of it there's a scene um where they're driving uh to two girl characters are driving in a car and alice and i had both talked about what the scene wanted to feel like um and and there was there was like fragments of an idea of what what the composition wanted to be but but we but we knew that the emotion was going to was going to dictate where the camera wanted to go in the scene um so we put the camera on a slider inside the car and i operated that scene because i i didn't really like i had an operator but i was like i don't I don't know how we're going to shoot this yet. It's completely going to be based on the performance um, and cues, like hints from each actor playing off of each other. And the camera just had to be ready for that. And 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 that was a great moment because it it really did work. Where it was they played off of each other and they were giving each other these these looks and there were these moments in between the dialogue that 
you know, it's not scripted and you have to, you know, be ready to capture those moments. And it's one of my favorite scenes in the film because it's just so genuinely like it captures the, the moment of that scene um, just by playing off the, the two characters playing off of each other. That's interesting. You actually, I think you kind of answered another question that came oh. in. There's, there's a, a friend of ours, an operator up in Vancouver that asked, how do you decide when you will operate or have yeah. an operator operate? And that's, uh, that's a great example of that. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is, that's definitely it. Um, I, I don't have an operator that often. Like I, like the half of it um, was one of the first movies I had an operator. Um, and I love the experience. Um, Kyle Wilschleger was the operator and he's amazing and um, can't wait to work with him again. Uh, but I did find that I, that there are certain moments in, in, in scenes that I, I have to operate. Um, and it's, and it's definitely scenes like that. It's, it's usually emotionally driven or it's a complicated scene with the character um that i feel like it's just it's there's too many layers of um opportunity to like miss a moment like like because it's it's a hard thing to explain of like if you could if you play off the performance and the performance shifts a little bit and and being ready to anticipate that shift um the, within the next take and not do the same thing over and over and over again like you know, it might have to change slightly because the performance might change slightly and just being able to go with the flow with that. Um, I love, I love that. I love when that happens too. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. And um, last question, cause I can't believe we're already coming to the end of our hour here, but yeah. um, there's a question about lenses and how you go about, mm -hmm. you know, choosing lenses uh, for that particular project. Yeah. For, for that, or any particular project. Any particular project. Any, any sorry. Particular, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's a long conversation um, with the director, and when I read a script, um, kind of the first thing we kind of determine is whether like whether we want to shoot it spherical or anamorphic, and sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. Um, and then depending on whether it's one or the other, and, and that can be determined not necessarily straight from the script or, or like the environment as well, um, or the aspect ratio or, and that, and that can um, come from the environment as well too, um, or how you want to capture the faces or use of negative space. Um, like, like four, three and, 240 it's like those are two very extreme different aspect ratios of using negative space in different ways um and like i loved how uh palermo um uh and david lowry used uh the aspect ratio for a ghost story um and it's just so like relevant to the story um and had so much purpose and it made so much sense it like had you know nothing to do with like just wanting to shoot an aspect ratio because like you know you could come up with these interesting compositions that was like very tied to the story and uh and we, and it would sort of similarly did that with light from light where we didn't we w we looked at a lot of different aspect ratios and, and some of it was the location um and and some of it was based off of like portraiture like paintings and it was that was an aspect ratio we felt like was the closest to that um and uh and a lot of our references were uh like european like french european film so uh, 166 <laughs> like, you know it just it, that just ended up being the right one but um but yeah i don't know it's it's a tr it's it's sometimes very complicated like light from light landing on uh the leica r's was was testing and it was like all of a sudden it was just like those are the right lenses. Um, so an emotional and, response to the yeah the yeah it was um, there was like there's like a natural vignette and and on on the larger sensor you feel it a little bit more and I really loved that and it just felt right for the film 
Um, so it's, it's a lot of testing and kind of figuring out what's, what's best fits the story. Oh, very cool. <laughs> I wish, I wish we could stay on and talk more. I'm, I, yeah. <laughs> But uh, get started. <laughs> yeah, I know it's great. Thank you so much. I, I really yeah. appreciate it. Um, all the time this week, you know, working through these images and talking about films. It's been great rediscovering them with you. So thank you for yeah, that. Yeah, this is really fun. <laughs> Hope you'll join us again soon and look forward yeah. to seeing more of your work. And congratulations again on the Tribeca Film so Festival. It's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Greta. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. And I'd like to take the time to thank all of you who joined us today. Um, our episodes will be available on our website, airyrental.com, where you can also check out all the unique and exciting products offered by Airy Rental. And you can follow us on youtube.com forward slash Airy Rental Group. Please join us next week um, for our episode on Wednesday, May 6th with cinematographer Michael Simmons. Okay. Until then, everyone, cheers.